Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for being here today. The focus of the discussion today is on the uh, Tan Seng Kee judgment uh, delivered by the Court of Appeal earlier this year. And the point is this. Is there a risk that the courts could strike down Section 377A in a future challenge? In the context of the Court of Appeal's comments uh, in Tan Seng Kee, Many of you will know that during the National Day Rally, the Prime Minister spoke about Section 377A, and uh, he said it is going to be repealed, and he gave two reasons. First, repealing Section 377A is the right thing to do. We should not criminalize what people do in the privacy of their bedrooms, and repealing Section 377A will provide some relief to gay people. Second, that the government has been advised that there is a significant legal risk that Section 377A could be struck down by the courts in future, in a future challenge. And he disclosed that the Attorney General and I had advised on that. The two points that he mentioned are two independent reasons for the repeal of Section 377A. And the first of the two reasons is in itself a substantive reason. And the Prime Minister explained during NDR why it was important to do this. So as I said, it's a reason that stands on its own. But I do not propose to go into that reason because the forum today, the focus is on the second point, the legal risks. First, the constitutionality of Section 377A itself and two, the question of locus standi. This topic is going to be discussed uh, extensively in Parliament. So today I will just summarize my views on the two points. Section 377A was challenged in Tan Seng Ki on the following grounds. First, on, under Article 9 of the Constitution, that it was in breach of Article 9, uh, in terms of you know, protection of life and liberty. Second, it was challenged under Article 14 of the Constitution, which guarantees freedom of speech and expression. And third, it was challenged under Article 12 of the Constitution, which provides for equality. What did the Court of Appeal say? I've, I'd like to be put up on Article 9, what you will see is that uh, the court said, and look at the words in blue, 9 1 of the Constitution. Look at no merit in the Article 14 constitutional challenge. Article 12, they said, we consider that this issue merits further reflection on a suitable occasion in future. So, Article 9 and Article 14, clear, just out of hand, but Article 12. Uh, I think lawyers will understand what that language means. The Court of Appeals said more, and they said that there were two approaches, two possible approaches on how the reasonable classification test uh, can apply. One is the approach in Lim Meng Swang, which was a 2014 decision, and second, the approach in Said Suhal, which is a more recent 2021 decision. The Court of Appeals said that the test to be preferred needed to be considered in the future. They went on to say that if the approach in Said Suhail was to be applied, then Section 377A might be unconstitutional. What has happened since Tan Seng Ki? Lawyers might know that the Court of Appeal has applied the Said Suhail approach to the reasonable classification test in two cases, in May of this year and in August of this year. So you put the two together, absent other considerations, 377A could be struck down, likely to be struck down by the courts if it's challenged again in the future under Article 12 of the Constitution. The Attorney General advised it. I know a little bit of the law, I advised it. And previous attorney generals have also advised it. That's on the legal point. 
It is also clear that the Court of Appeal preferred not to decide the point. It said that highly contentious societal issues, like Section 377A, should be resolved through the political process in Parliament, by Parliament. If you look at um, what they have said, politics seems the more obvious choice in litigation for debating and resolving highly contentious societal issues. See the next part in blue, the court must refrain from trespassing onto what is properly the territory of Parliament. And the last paragraph, what is in blue and um, red, each branch to respect the institutional space and legitimate prerogatives of the others. Each branch must be allowed to exercise fully and fairly the powers it has been allocated. So in effect, dealing with Section 377A is in the province of Parliament. So some have said, OK, the Court of Appeal has said they don't want to decide this. This should be within the province of Parliament. So it's up to Parliament, and therefore Parliament doesn't need to do anything. That is a very wrong approach. Uh, I disagree completely. It's both wrong in constitutional law, and it's wrong in principle. There are three major branches of government. Parliament, the executive comprising the cabinet and civil service, and the judiciary. Each has its role. If Parliament fails in its duty to do what is right, then the courts will have to do what they don't want to do. It's as simple as that. Courts have said this is within the province of Parliament. That does not mean the courts are saying that they will not act. What they are saying is, we leave it to Parliament to go and do what is right. In Singapore, things have worked because each branch does what is right and what is their duty. If there is a law in the books which is unconstitutional, what is the duty of parliament? What's the duty of the executive? To deal with it or to put on the helmet, go into the bunker and pretend that it doesn't exist because it's politically too divisive. That's not the way things work in Singapore. You do the right thing. You don't duck. The second legal issue relates to locus standi. Court of Appeal said that it did not have to decide on the Article 12 challenge because the appellants didn't have standing. They didn't have locus standi to pursue the challenge in the courts. It looks a complicated word, but basically whether you have a right that's been infringed, which allows you to make a challenge. They pointed to the political compromise by the government in 2007 not to enforce Section 377A, which was elaborated upon in 2018 by the Attorney General as the public prosecutor. The Court of Appeal said that this created legitimate expectations that the public prosecutor will not prosecute under Section 377A. And therefore, the appellants do not face any credible threat of prosecution under 377A and so they have no standing to challenge 377A. So again, because of this, some have said there is no risk of 377A being struck down in the future as long as a public prosecutor does not prosecute anyone. And again, if only life was so simple. These comments that there is no risk are based on two premises. First, that the locus standi point is a complete answer to any legal challenge. And second, that the courts will never change their mind on locus standi. On the first point, whether locus standi is a complete answer, just because the appellants in Tan Seng Ki did not have locus standi does not necessarily mean that no one else has locus standi. There are people who might argue that they have standing not on the grounds of a fear of prosecution, but on the grounds of fear of enforcement in other ways. In Tan Seng Ki, the Court of Appeal took great pains to carefully restrict its views on locus standi to the context of prosecution only. They expressly excluded police investigations. 
Now, there is a broad universe of cases where the police may have to conduct investigations, because before you conduct investigations, you wouldn't know what the facts are. If any such investigation in some way relates to conduct, which the police didn't realize earlier, but which then relates to conduct falling within Section 377A, someone could argue that they have locus standi because investigations have been expressly excluded by the Court of Appeal. So there is nothing to prevent someone from arguing 377A is unconstitutional. I have been unfairly investigated. That person will have standing. So there is a risk that a future court could find that the possibility of investigation under 377A is sufficient for there to be locus standi, and investigations can arise in many contexts. So the argument on locus standi is not as complete a defense as some may hope. Secondly, as lawyers know, points like locus standi, the Court of Appeal can change its mind. The Tansen Key judgment itself shows this. Because in previous cases, they just dismissed all arguments. Tansen Key, they said Article 12 may potentially be uh, violated. That's a change of mind. And on locus standi, Tansen Key recognized the doctrine of substantive legitimate expect expectations, where it had previously left the question open on whether this doctrine should be part of Singapore law. So we cannot rule out that the Court of Appeal could change its mind and say that even if there is no prosecution, the fact that a man technically commits a crime in law each time he has sex with another man might be sufficient for locus standi. So in summary, my views on the two issues, first, the Court of Appeal has strongly suggested that Section 377A is unconstitutional. It is in breach of Article 12. And second, the locus standi point is anything but complete. So what are the possible consequences if 377A is struck down? Then the definition of marriage as it stands today will almost certainly be challenged by someone. That is why the government is moving to uh, keep the current definition of marriage within the province of parliament, amending the constitution to prevent any challenge in the courts on that. Because in our view, that has to be decided in parliament, not anywhere else. So some have said, why doesn't the government instead amend the constitution to protect section 377A from court challenges? It's also been suggested, why don't you amend the constitution to protect the definition of marriage and leave section 377A alone? And if the court of appeal strikes it down in the future, then so be it. So, you know, I will deal with these suggestions when we debate the repeal of Section 377A in Parliament. They are wrong in principle. They require Parliament to do not the right thing, but the wrong thing. And that I don't think Parliament ought to do. But I'll explain that when we deal with this in Parliament. So I've shared my views. Look forward to a fruitful discussion. I would like to introduce my panelists today. And of course, on my far right, Mr. Adrian Tan, President of the Law Society. And on my right, Professor Leslie Chu, Dean of the Singapore University of Social Sciences School of Law. And then um, Jacqueline, Professor Jacqueline Neo from the NUS Faculty of Law. And Jacqueline is also the Director of Asian Center of Legal Studies at NUS. And not forgetting um, Professor Michael Hall, who is going to dial in virtually. Michael is with the Faculty of Law at the Hong Kong University. People ask me about this case and they say, was there really a big legal risk, the Tan Sin Key case? And it's quite obvious to lawyers that there was a huge legal risk from beginning to end of the Court of Appeals judgment. Um, they were raising red flags all the way. They were saying, look, this time the legal challenge is not going to succeed, but next time it probably will. Um, and it probably will because it violates Article 12 of the Constitution. Why do you criminalize male-male sex, but not female-female sex? That was the gist of it. But the, the bigger question non-lawyers ask me is this, uh, so what? So what? 
if there's going to be a legal challenge, and so what if that succeeds? And that's where the Court of Appeal actually started off their judgment. They were saying, um, it's, it's a really bad idea if we change laws through the courts. There's basically two ways that society can change laws. There's a messy legalistic process, which is asking the court to repeal a law. And there's a neat democratic process, which is through the legislature. And this seems kind of obvious to me. And I would say it would seem kind of obvious to most Singaporeans maybe 30, 40 years ago. But since then, we've had the influence of the West, uh, particularly of America, where they have uh, court challenges to change their laws as a matter of course. And that's because they don't trust their democratic process. That's my personal observation. The, the main thing that the Court of Appeal said is that politics is the more obvious choice than litigation for debating and resolutions aimed to persuade us, the voters, and win our hearts and minds. And litigation isn't the role of the court to mediate differences in society. Litigation is a zero-sum adversarial game with a win-lose outcome. On the other hand, the political process strives for compromise, consensus in which no side um, has to lose everything. So, in a sense to me, the Tan Sin Ki case uh, also puts a bigger question to Singaporeans. How do we want to effect change in society? Do we want to do it through our democratic process or do we want to go to court and, and challenge that we don't like? Um, it's messy to do it that way when we go to court to challenge laws because the, the thing about laws is that most of them are interconnected. And if we change a law through parliament, it's much neater because the legislature will say, when we amend this law and we change that law, we'll also change section three of another law to make sure everything is working in harmony. And the whole process is transparent and it's debated. And it takes the amount of time that it requires. Something through the court, it's quite brutal. The court is not probably going to say, when I strike down this law, I'm also going to look at 10 other laws that may refer to it. The court is just going to strike down that law and then leave everybody else hanging. So my personal opinion is that's a very messy way to effect change in society and my an undesirable way to proceed. So to me, that's the bigger lesson of Tan Seng Ki. I think I share pretty much similar views, but I'd like to make some observations of the case. Minister Uzi alluded to the fact about the constitutionality, and it's quite obvious from the judgment that the court is saying if it comes up, uh, it could be challenged. Uh, but I think the broader issue is this. In every legal challenge, particularly constitutional law, uh, and, and, and indeed in any other aspect of law, it depends on the matrix of the case and how one characterizes the case. So that is why if you read the judgment, the judgment says, if you were to interpret it in this way, it could be struck with yourself. It's never certain. It really depends on the depends on what's happening, and things do evolve. And the uh, minister mentioned about the fact that the court may change its mind. That's actually law. The court, the apex court, it's not bound by its own decisions. We as lawyers know that. The second point I'd like to raise. Uh, is the local standard issue. The local standard issue is basically the right to bring challenges. It's actually a procedural point. It does not touch the substantive. As has been pointed out, not only by minister, but other commentators, it can arise in some other way. The last point I'd like to make is uh, to expand a little bit on what uh, Adrian has mentioned. And, and, and really, the these issues, as the court has pointed out, is surrounded by a lot of extra legal issues, which a court is not really the proper forum. In Singapore, I think we have not politicized the, the many of our issues, and we should not, because it really properly belongs to the people uh, rather than in the courtroom, where at the end of the day, it's adversarial. And adversarial, by definition, means you know you try to put one over the other side. I think both Adrian and Leslie has helped us to really see the distinction between the two processes for 
uh, um, affecting legal changes. And I think Professor Jacqueline Neal will add on to that. So I'm going to make two um, comments. So on the first, um, I think we have to recognize that the law has changed significantly. The CA has affirmed that reasonableness is now part of the calculus in applying the reasonable classification test uh, for Article 12.1 on equal protection of the law. The court also said that it would take into account whether the law affects an individual's life and liberty. Now, reasonableness um, gives the court more evaluative discretion, which means that it remains open for future determination. Can Section 377A be struck down if a future litigant is able to show that the reasonable person would consider it discriminatory? This remains a very real question. And bear in mind, especially, that reasonableness does not require unanimity. It merely seeks reasonable agreement, not unanimous agreement. And so under this reasonable classification test, the likelihood of Section 377A being struck down in a future case is very real. Now, uh, my second point is, uh, relates to the substantive legitimate expectation and its application. Now, um, it must be emphasized that applying SLE to prosecutions under Section 377A can only be a stopgap measure. It is not a permanent uh, suspension of all prosecutions. The application of SLE has limited effect and is limited in time. It can be overridden by an express statement by the AG. When a decision maker is given a discretion to exercise a power, it is incumbent on that decision maker to exercise that power and not determine absolutely in advance how that power is going to be exercised. And lastly, I suppose one will have to also ask, how can the current AG bind future AGs? If it cannot be done, then the threat of prosecution could arise again. And this goes to the point of local standi. How Minister pointed out, local standi is um, not a complete stop on future challenges, and it's not a final stop. To me, the, 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 the most important thing about this, this, this whole topic is, is what now do we do? Why do we need to repeal 377A? Well, to put it bluntly, yeah, uh, uh, the, the answer is that because it is only half dead, yeah, the dead bit is that it, 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 it now apparently is, is unprosecutable yeah, uh, in, in total, right? So you cannot charge, uh, uh, or rather you can't convict anyone yeah, uh, under, under this section at all. But um, there remains what I call the zombie bits, yeah? um, uh, the, you know, the dead and yet alive and, and not quite dead. Yeah. The first thing is uh, in the context of the criminal law, yeah, right? the, the Court of Appeal uh, did not say anything about what I call the penumbral offences of attempt, abetment, conspiracy. Yeah, right? It should follow that it, 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 it is also prohibited, but, but again, the Court of Appeal did not say that. Yeah. Moving away from the, the, the criminal law, yeah, right? um, I thought about what, what about um, in the civil law, yeah? can landlords turn out uh, or, or rather throw out yeah, um, uh, 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 tenants for 377A activities because they do remain illegal? Yeah? The last reason, yeah, the most important one, yeah, is that uh, beyond the law, yeah, you cannot ignore the, the societal and psychological damage that continues to borrow a, a Shakespearean uh, kind of uh, inversion. Yeah? It is twice cursed. Yeah? <laughs> right? the, the very existence of, of 377A right? uh, um, uh, reinforces the, 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 the um, uh, sort of ill will yeah? um, uh, uh, so, uh, between one party and the other. Yeah? And, and that also for the, for, the, for the party that is targeted, yeah? Right, it reinforces feelings of exclusion, inferior, inferiority, and, and so on. Yeah. And this last point here, the degree of trust which the people have with the government. Yeah. So if the government decides, uh, let's keep 377A, then the public will think, oh, government must have a good reason for keeping 377A, so therefore it should be there. On the other hand, if the government says we're going to repeal it, public again trusts the government's assessment and, and, and will say, oh, fine, throw it off. Yeah. Okay, so the, 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 the very existence of it, um, uh, 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 affects the, the 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 public opinion, but I I I personally think that, that, that 
that to couple to couple the repeal of 377 with the the the, the, the so-called the, the 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 marriage uh, uh, amendment it leaves a, a strange taste in the mouth what appears to be on the cards is a constitutional ouster clause yeah, to prevent the courts from reviewing the constitutionality of uh, 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 of, of a marriage definition which ex excludes same sex marriage but but think about it the, the, an ouster clause is needed only if that particular uh, law, um, there is a strong enough case for its unconstitutionality. And there is a strong enough case um, uh, when, you know, um, uh, the, the exclusion of same-sex partnerships cannot be adequately, satisfactorily, legally, constitutionally justified. This uh, contrasting response with 377A. 377A might well be struck down by the courts, so we repeal it first. Marriage definition might also be struck down by the courts, but we protect it, yeah, right? Um, the question is why the different treatment, yeah, right? So what do I think is the right thing to do, yeah, right? Um, um, I think we should leave the constitution and the courts alone, yeah, right? The government will repeal 377A, that is a done deal. And I think we should initiate, initiate discussion, a public discussion on same-sex marriage. Right. Dispassionately, the government should assess the arguments for and against and make a decision you know, as to, to, to which set of arguments are stronger or not. If 377A is a matter for parliament, marriage is even more a matter for parliament. And this government has been so careful in the way we are proceeding with the amendment because we respect both the democratic process and we respect the courts. So all we are saying is this should not be dealt with in the courts. If anybody wants to change the definition of marriage, if that's what Singaporeans want, somebody has got to organize themselves, put it on your manifesto, argue, go into the general elections arguing that this is what you stand for, win the elections, change the law. That's how a democracy ought to work. We said the definition of marriage that exists today in the Women's Charter is something this government is deeply committed to. And we believe that while many people would either not mind or would be uh, welcome the repeal of 377A, we don't think Singaporeans are ready for a major sea change in the tonality of our society and the way our society is the day after. Then this is why these matters ought to be dealt with in Parliament. I can't speak for a generation 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now. This government is committed to this definition of marriage. We have given uh, in very clear terms where we stand. The next prime minister has indicated that where he stands and his cabinet stands. And uh, because people recognize that this government has a substantive majority in parliament, and because it has made clear its stand, I can imagine those who would like to see the change in the definition would prefer that the matter be dealt with in the courts. They stand a better chance in the courts than they stand in parliament, but that's not democracy. <laughs> so that is why we put our cards on the table and we say we are going to protect the definition of marriage from legal challenges. And that is why we are amending the Constitution, or hoping to amend the Constitution. Thank you. These are my personal views. I think that the reason that we should repeal 377A is simply because it's the right thing to do. I applaud you on the political commitment to do that. Um, but I think we also need to realize that there are very legitimate concerns. We know that when you do this, there will be, I suppose, unhappiness or maybe both sides of the fence. You can't please everyone. But what can we do to ensure that there is a safe space for engagement? We don't want to go the way of some Western countries where you can't even express a view without being cancelled. Uh, at the same time, we have to remember that those on the LGBT side of the line, they are our brothers, our sisters, our friends, uh, our children. Now, at the end of the day, as you said, it's for Parliament to decide, and Parliament comprises parliamentarians, and ultimately, we vote parliamentarians in, so ultimately, it's us. It's us, our values, 
our, our values only evolve in the context of a continuing conversation. So it may be that we disagree with each other for a long time, but there may be points where we can find agreement, safe spaces, um, and, and accommodation. The easiest thing to have done would have been to just put the judgment away and wait for the next challenge and pretend that it doesn't exist. We won't be uh, having a lot of unhappiness on different sides. But is that the right thing to do? We shouldn't leave an unconstitutional law on the books, but it is also independently the right thing to do, we think. Okay? Now, what does this mean for education of our kids in government schools? What does this mean for free-to-air TV channels? What does it mean for people in churches uh, to preach cancel culture? Are we going to all be canceled if we express a view that is not uh, quote unquote acceptable to uh, others? The answer is that we are looking at this very carefully. Education, what can be taught in our schools, government funded schools has to follow the definition of marriage which is another reason why the definition of marriage needs to be protected. Free to air channels then must take their reference from the current state of what a marriage is. It doesn't mean there will be no depiction of alternate lifestyles. And I think we all have to be careful about uh, trying to uh, police this so strictly that you know our children cannot hear and see and. No, it's, a, it's an open society. Cancel culture is something that I have on record as saying that I intend to look at. In real life, we will not allow five people to come together and beat you up. Why are we allowing it in the virtual world? My team has been looking at this and we intend to do the best we can to try and uh, deal with this. So after this repeal, which we think you know, is the right thing to do and it should come as a relief for a lot of people. They're not criminals. But at the same time, no one else should be required to accept a different uh, tone to society uh, because some people believe in it. It's, uh, it's what the majority think, where the weight of uh, society is on these sorts of social mores. And uh, our laws should work towards uh, giving a framework to that. And that's what this government is absolutely committed to. And precisely the reason why these matters are matters for parliament. In terms of how the debates have been played out in other countries with regards to uh, matters concerning same-sex marriage, there are concerns that when you have um, sort of same-sex marriage, the freedom of conscience would be undermined and that the Constitution does not provide sufficient guarantees for um, the freedom of conscience for persons who um, may disagree with a particular position. And so, I th um, and so I think to legislate on this rather than to leave it to the courts to address these issues would be very important and really the sensible thing to do. The second sort of source of contention in other jurisdictions stems from the availability of laws that deals with horizontal discrimination. So um, these are laws that allows for um, uh, legal challenges to be made against a business uh, establishment, for instance, who, uh, which discriminates against um, a person on the basis of that person's sexual orientation and so on. We don't have a horizontal discrimination legislation as yet. And so again, I think these are issues that need to be um, addressed in parliament to be properly um, discussed in a democratic forum to take into account these different concerns that will affect um, people's um, beliefs and their conscience. I think um, for the most part, uh, all people in the legal profession and um, legal educators can agree that 377A might, uh, has the risk of being struck down as unconstitutional and that in and of itself is undesir undesirable. But I think that 
the lay person might not understand the reason, this reasoning behind repealing 377A. I think we can all agree that what your beliefs in, uh, your sexuality is not a matter of uh, public discussion. Nobody wants to discuss what you should and should not feel or believe in. But um, at the same time, uh, this line of reasoning might come, uh, will come up when discussing about marriage. Repealing 377A is saying that okay, homosexual conduct is not being condemned, then why is it that we cannot marry each other? The homosexuals might ask that. Should the government, uh, should parliament go in depth, uh, explain in depth the legal reason behind repealing 377A? And uh, how would you propose as legal educators, um, the panelists, how would you propose that be done in parliament? I think that you have raised to me, an important issue. But having said that, you, you as a law student should realise that technical knowledge does not necessarily engender understanding of the issues when it comes to policy issues. I think that the education should come very broadly. No layperson is going to read any commentary any one of us writes. I think we have to accept that. I think the other issue that I've... This is a personal view. I think that... Uh, education on the law should begin at a much younger age than we are used to uh, in broad in a broad sense not the technical sense i think that citizenship requires you to understand how your society functions but everybody has to understand when we come to larger issues like that, it's not about right or wrong it's about a system that we have and we operate within this system now I often tell young people who are very vehement about things, if you disagree violently outside the framework, it's not evolution, it's revolution. So you have to work within what I call the evolutionary framework. You go into the system and state your case and garner the support that you need to change things. And I think that's how we have always, as a society, evolved. I think it's going to be difficult to put it across to them people, a uh, fairly technical constitutional law point, better than how the Prime Minister did it at the National Day Rally. He explained the substantive reasons, the non-legal reasons, why we should do this, why this is the right thing to do. Second, when it came to the law, he was much more succinct. He just said the Attorney General and the Minister for Law advised that there is a significant legal risk. <laughs> I'm not used to having my advice talked about in public, but he decided you know, rather than talking about the substance of the legal position, you know, we take advice, this is the position, there is a significant le legal risk, trust us, we are doing the right thing. As an academic, we are of course not all, well, you're usually not the right people to speak to the masses, um, unless clearly we sometimes uh, make things a bit too complicated. But I agree that constitutional consciousness is important, that we need to um, allow people the ability to learn about the Constitution and to learn about certain serious matters that do and can affect their lives. Um, the qu question, I suppose, that we need to address is how, what is the best way to do it? Um, the law society could be involved, the government could be involved in all of that. But I want to also mention that um, sometimes a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. I think forums like this where we could have a um, very clear um, discussion about what the Constitution says, about what uh, the cases say would be helpful. Um, and then, you know, the communication to the masses about what the Constitution requires, um, that is something that then needs to be communicated clearly as well. I would like to save this time for anyone who still don't think that there's any significant risk that 377A could be struck down on a constitutional challenge. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if anyone thinks that there is no legal risk. <laughs> Can somebody, anybody put up their hands if anyone thinks that there is no legal risk after hearing us? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. In view of time constraints, can we just take the last two questions? The minister says that if anyone believes in a certain viewpoint, then they should mobilise and campaign for it in the next general elections. Um, but that's not right, is it? Because to encourage people to run on a single issue platform is extremely problematic. 
and it pits the progress of what has worked before in society against the surfacing of these valid single issues. So my question is, um, what is the government doing to to um, execute its responsibility to accurately capture and represent the current sentiments of the people on the ground? Am I encouraging people to run on a single issue? Absolutely no. I'm not suggesting that people run on a single issue. But uh, I'm saying this is a political issue to be dealt with in Parliament. And if you believe that it is your duty to convert the majority of people to want to change, your manifesto will cover a broad variety of things. And it can cover this as well. Be honest with the people, because later on when you go into Parliament, you would have told people what you're doing. I think that your real point is, look, obviously the PAP has a significant majority now and may well have in the near future. And are you really listening to the people who want to change? Some people would like this definition of marriage changed. But since we are now going to take that away, then some other people are expressing the unhappiness. You, the PAP, why don't you be more listening to us? Uh, it's not a question of listening to one group or another. We listen to everybody, but in the end, we have to say this is what we believe in. But as I said, this is a continuing conversation with our brothers and sisters, and uh, you know we have to convince each other. In the end, what are we in politics for? You know, benefit of country, society, and people. And we think this is what is in the benefit of country today. My question is one that is uh, centers around the economy. Now, Singapore is an open economy, and we are home to global companies. And we see and know that uh, a broader diversity of views do also permeate within these organizations. And they could be contrarian to the kind of uh, narrative that the minister has been talking about this afternoon. How does this sit as it pertains to companies and global companies coming into Singapore taking a broader, diverse view uh, and also permeate, permeating that kind of thinking into the philosophy of the organization? How does it sit with companies? I think we should have a society in Singapore where we live and let live, but we also shouldn't force people, if they believe that their religion forbids them to do something, that then we should force them to go and do the very opposite of what you know, their religious beliefs are. So I think we ought to have conversations with the MNCs that uh, while we understand that they have their values, we also have our values, and we have to find a way where we can coexist. There are no clean-cut solutions. You just have to engage. I think we must recognize and accept the hurt that people in the LGBT community feel and we must accept that that is wrong for them to be hurt in that way, and we must right the wrong. But at the same time, we also see that, you know, there are other parts of our social values which need to be protected. So it's, uh, we should try and bring people together, not say, oh, they are this and we are this. You know, it's one society. Thank you. I'd like to 